Andrew with CPR Instructor Affiliates, powered by Prime Medical Training, a nationwide AHA training center. And today we're going to be talking about uh, ACLS algorithms, specifically the ROSC algorithm. We've done videos on all the other algorithms for ACLS. You can check those out on our channel. Um, but the reason why that we've created these is because we found that the little pocket reference cards that the AHA puts out are just chock full of information and the formatting of them is difficult for students to navigate and find the information that they're looking for. And so years ago, we created this um, simple format of writing out the algorithms, giving them highlights and things that they need to know to be successful in, in doing ACLS. And so um, what we'll do is we start by writing the name of the algorithm up on the board, ROS, Return of Spontaneous Circulation, and then I'll ask, they'll say, how do we know if somebody's in ROSC? And the answer generally is going to be a uh, pulse check. And that is correct. But I always say that's the old school method. So the new school method is called waveform capnography. And uh, there's some numbers you need to know when you use waveform capnography. First is uh, what the number should be during a code. So I'll write code up here and I'll say that it should be greater than 10 millimeters mercury. Now, if you get ROSC back, you should see an immediate spike of greater than 40 millimeters of mercury. And then once we send them to the uh, unit, get them innovated, uh, we need to make sure that we maintain a CO2 of 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury, which is where you and I sit on a daily basis. So you give them these numbers um, and, and then I let them know like waveform capnography is the most reliable way of knowing whether you got somebody back according to the AHA. And it is true because, um, you know, one, it's phenomenal because it's real time. You don't have to wait to the end of your two minutes of CPR to check for a pulse and see if somebody has it. You'll see that spike happen immediately when it happens during CPR. The second cool thing about, um, about waveform patinography is that, uh, you know, it's definitive. When you do a pulse check on somebody, sometimes you're really having to jam your fingers into their carotid or their femoral to see if there's a pulse or not because it can be weak and thready. Not with waveform, with waveform capnography, that's a non-issue. When you see those bars go up, it's it's a done deal. Um, one thing that I do share with my students, I talk about uh, you know during a code how it should be greater than ten, uh, and if it's not it's related to one of two things. Either it's poor quality compressions or it's hyperventilation slash oxygenation of the patient. Now, in the written test, the AHA actually asks this question and says, what would be the cause of a, of a waveform less than 10? And they give both of those reasons, um, poor quality compressions or poor you know, ventilation. And the right answer on the test is poor quality compressions. But I can say from my experience on the truck that that is never the case. The case is always related to hyperventilation slash oxygenation. Those people up at the head, they're bagging super fast and I have to ask them to please slow it down. And as soon as they do, whoop, there goes the waveform. And so that is really the definitive way of, um, of maintaining what I have found to be um, the, the root cause of low CO2 levels. Um, but anyway, whichever way you do it, pulse check or waveform capnography, when you verify that you're in ROS, we have a number of things that need to be done. So uh, first is what I, I tell them I write up here, the assessment, I put here BP for blood pressure, and then down here I put coma. Then I draw these little brackets and, uh, and I say, all right, assessment wise, what should we be putting in orders for when we get ROSC back? And uh, the answers that I want are directly tied to the mega code um, skills test. And so these are critical criteria. They have to verbalize these in order to pass. And so I wanna make sure that they know what they are. Now assessment's going to be um, chest x-ray, 
12 lead. Um, vital signs and labs. I tell them, all right, when you get to the Ross algorithm in your mega code, just make sure to rattle these things off. And when you ask for vital signs, it's going to lead you into our next bracket, which is blood pressure. So um, I, I'll ask them, I say, what does the systolic, the systolic number need to be less than in order for us to treat it? And the answer is 90. So if you have, a, let nine, if you have less than 90 systolic, you're going to need to do some treatments, which is going to be uh, one to two liters of normal saline, uh, at the dopamine, drip, epinephrine drip, uh, any one of these, uh, you know, use your discretion to fix the, the blood pressure, but we only want to get the blood pressure up to 90 systolic. We don't go higher than that. And the reason is we just don't want to overburden the heart. Um, it's been through a very traumatic experience. 90 is, is essential for making sure that we're still perfusing organs. Um, however, uh, any, any higher than that is going to be unnecessary at the time and it's just going to put more of a strain on the heart. Then we talk about comatose. So what happens if a comatose, which the majority of uh, cardiac survivors or cardiac arrest survivors are going to be comatose um, after, after the cardiac arrest, we need to do two things. One is if we haven't already, we need to establish an advanced airway. Part of that is so that we can maintain the waveform capnography of 35 to 45. Uh, and then we're going to do targeted temperature management. And we do this for 32 to 36 degrees Celsius. And we do it for up to 24 hours before we start the rewarming process. And again, I usually will be putting, instead of telling them this, um, I do a lot more asking because I want them to be, uh, if they don't know the answer, I want them to be engaged in their books, engaged in their uh, reference cards, finding the answer. I wanna teach them, one, how to find it so that when we get to the mega code and the written exam, they're familiar with how to use these resources and where to look for the answers. But the second thing is, when you look for it on your own and you're having to dig, and you don't have somebody just telling you, you're, you are, that's a next level of learning and you're instilling this information and, and solidifying it more and you'll have a better likelihood of retaining it because you went searching for it other than somebody just handing you and volunteering this information for you. So um, make them look, don't give them the answers. But this is the ROSC algorithm, very simple um, and, uh, and, and really uh, this is going to help them tremendously both in their in the classroom performance and out in real life. And, uh, and I also go on to explain about targeted temperature management and just ask them, hey, what is this for? Most people know part of what it's for, but they don't know maybe the full understanding. So um, target temperature management, we cool them down for two reasons, actually. Most people only know one or the other. Uh, one is we are trying to preserve the neurological um, uh, well, we're just trying to preserve the person's um, neuro. And so uh, making sure that they don't have any deficits post cardiac arrest. And uh, a lot of people, when they come out of cardiac arrest are febrile. And so it can damage brain cells. And, and by cooling them down, we're preserving their brain um, and making sure they come out intact neurologically. Um, the second thing is when, when you cool somebody's body down, um, you slow their metabolism down as well. And when you slow their metabolism down, um, the heart doesn't have to function as hard to produce oxygen, to produce energy and whatnot for the body. And so um, it gives the heart a rest and allows it to start healing uh, because it's been through a very traumatic process. So targeted temperature management affects the heart and helps it heal and improve and it also affects the brain, helps it with its healing and uh, prevention of further injury. So uh, I like to explain that to people, make sure they understand why we do what we do. Um, and that, that's the full algorithm. I would love to hear if you guys have your own way of doing it. 
Um, if you would like to leave it in the comments below, I'd be very interested to collaborate and, uh, and compile best practices. Um, and uh, please make sure to follow uh, this channel. We put out videos like this all the time uh, related to maybe teaching a class, product reviews, how to run and grow a CPR business. Um, and so we'd love to engage with you in that way. Following us, like this video if it helped you. And uh, this is Andrew with CPR Instructor Affiliates powered by Climb Medical Training. We'll see you in the next video.